ready. Camera, ready? <laughs> okay, I'm just giving myself a timer so I know when to stop. Uh, cool. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is George Brisker, um, until recently of the Foundation for Research and Technology Hellas, uh, which is uh, the main uh, driver of the initiative to create uh, CDOC CRM uh, and uh, currently still a main uh, driver of the maintenance and uh, moving forward of that uh, standard. And I think my role here today is to try to give uh, in a succinct way an overview of what CDOC CRM is and uh, a very high level overview of what that model is because that's the activity that's going to be happening in the workshop is trying to understand how to uh, re-represent conservation data using this ontology. Uh, now, presenting that, the, the whole model within 45 minutes is a bit of a challenge for somebody to present and also a bit of a challenge for people to uh, take on board. So uh, if it seems a bit much uh, or a bit too little, <laughs> could be either way, um, uh, we're going to be working on it for two afternoons in a row, so I think we'll be able to fill in those details. Um, Oh, I see my timer makes the sound of crickets well. Okay, that's not useful. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I will be talking about uh, things in four sections, the background and intended function of CDOC CRM, uh, some tips and tricks for what you should be doing when you're trying to learn this ontology, then uh, the big chunks uh, of the top part of the ontology, and then if we have time, point at a few tools that could be used. Um, so to talk about the background and function. Uh, CDOC CRM uh, is a uh, formal ontology. Uh, that is to say, it's a representation uh, of an area of uh, uh, scholarly in investigation that is meant to cover different uh, data formats and be able to re-represent information and combine information from different schemas, different databases, into one uh, common view. Uh, it was uh, launched, uh, the whole process of building it was launched in uh, 1996 uh, in uh, the context of ICOM. Uh, they were trying to create uh, the database of all databases for museum information uh, and built a giant relational database that, that didn't work. Uh, and so they decided to try this idea of knowledge representation. Uh, and since then, uh, the model has really took off. Uh, in 2006, it was formalized as an ISO standard, uh, and then uh, the development of it has been that uh, CDOC CRM itself uh, isn't so much a, a museum model anymore, the base model, uh, but is a general representation of information about the past and cultural heritage data. Uh, and then, uh, in the meantime, people are doing more specific work, more specific research on different topics, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, hopefully that's the kind of outcome that's going to come out of this work uh, in LCD is that, uh, for example, conservation data uh, is very rich uh, and uh, has not been uh, focused on as a topic of modeling in CDOC CRM. So that's something uh, that the, the, the model is not fixed, it's not that there's Take this CDOC CRM and it describes all of your worlds, but CDOC CRM provides you a base way of modeling information and then you can extend it out uh, based upon your kinds of research and have a more accurate representation of what you're trying to do. So um, that's CDOC CRM. Um, so an ontology uh, is basically a representation of information in uh, classes and relations, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Uh, so CDOC CRM has 90 classes and 150 relations, more or less, in the base. Uh, and then I, I told you about the sort of extended work with other communities. So the top level gives you a general language for describing uh, how things happened in the past, who was there, what was involved, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, different modeling was working, work has gone on with different communities to model more and more specific information. So there's CRM Geo, uh, which is for documenting and modeling uh, geographic information. CRM Inf is for documenting and modeling argumentation. Uh, so it's sort of meta modeling over uh, what you do with uh, information in an information system and how you argue from it. CRM Psi, which will be something that will come up. Uh, I, 
guests appear a bit in our modeling discussions later in the afternoon is for documenting the scientific process, process uh, and uh, experiments. Uh, CRM PA and CRM Archeo are for modeling uh, archeological uh, dig information. CRM dig is for modeling digitization processes and digital objects. And FRBR OO uh, was a, is an ongoing collaboration with the IFLA uh, community uh, for harmonizing the library information, but it's also a very powerful model for describing creative processes in general. So you can see that CRM, CRM is expanding and getting richer, and uh, uh, it'll be very interesting to see the outcome of uh, the whole LCD initiative in terms of whether or not it will officially extend the CDOC CRM uh, around conservation information. Uh, so I discussed that already. Uh, so CDOC CRM is a standard, uh, and uh, the word standard means a lot of things to a lot of different people, uh, and so it's uh, useful to differentiate in what way it's a standard. Uh, so oftentimes uh, in the cultural her heritage world, the standard would be, well, we're going to prescribe you a certain schema and uh, a certain way of documenting things, uh, and if you follow that, then you'll be in line with us. Uh, CDOC CRM isn't a standard in that way. It, it's a standard for, it's not trying to replace the systems that you already have and the way that you already document things, uh, but rather provides a standard way of re-describing them in such a way that they can be uh, compatible with information produced by your colleagues. So if you choose tool X uh, that uh, is suitable to your organization and somebody else chooses a spreadsheet, uh, but you need to, you're talking about the same information, uh, it's a standard for re-representing that information in a semantic network uh, that would allow you uh, to make your information compatible. So this diagram is trying to represent that idea. So the idea is that scholars work in different databases, these little boxes of those different databases. They learn the CDOC CRM as uh, we hope to do to today. Uh, and then you take that data structure, your own data structure, you map it to CDOC CRM concepts and relations and you transform the data, then it comes into this layer, uh, which allows you to do all the linking and the interrelation that Thanasis was referencing at the start. Um, but you have references back to where you got that information. And so now you can start to get fed more information from a colleague who has studied a similar object or indeed that same object. Um, but you continue to work in your own system, you have a larger reference system to work with overall. Um, which is more complicated to achieve than it sounds. Um, and this is very specific, so I'll jump over it, give myself more time. Um, so uh, today we'll be learning through doing in terms of applying the CDOC CRM and uh, I guess some of you have already worked with uh, CDOC CRM or an ontology and some of you haven't, uh, but I thought it'd be worthwhile to take a moment about talking about how to uh, work with an ontology. So uh, the ontology itself uh, is just a manual uh, with a list of classes and relations. Uh, and if you open that up and try reading it uh, and uh, then hope to arrive at some sort of conclusion, you're going to be disappointed and angry uh, and you won't get very far. So you need some sort of strategy for thinking about what you're doing with learning uh, CDOC CRM. And the way I like to think about it is that uh, CDOC CRM is giving you a sort of interlingua for re-expressing data from your systems into a common system. So. The background of that is to think uh, that uh, we all live in the same world and we're t all talking about the same thing. So our, my database uh, distorts my world and makes me express things in this way because that's the fields that I have in your database, allows you to express things in this way. But in the end, we, we all want to talk about and describe things, uh, the same things. So CDOC CRM is trying to allow you to do that. So we have one world, your data structure is trying to help you make propositions about that world. Um, when we are trying to map information out of the data structure into CDOC CRM, we're trying to understand in each uh, field, uh, what does this say about the world and how do I use CDOC CRM as a mini language to say that thing again? Um, so, carrying on with this, uh, 
language analogy. Uh, so, as I said earlier, Sirach Sirem uh, is an ontology, and an ontology is made up of classes and relations. So you can think about the classes as being kinds of nouns, and the relations being kinds of verbs, uh, and they're logically defined, so you can only use them in very specific ways. Um, and I think that this background of thinking about it that way uh, is a good way to get over the fact to sometimes people come to CDOC CRM and they say, well, it has 90 classes and 150 relations, and it sounds a bit complicated to me. Uh, but if you think about how difficult it is to learn a language, uh, if you only had to learn 90 nouns and 150 verbs, uh, then you'd be extremely happy and say, no, I've got Spanish. Well, you have the chance to do that for potentially all cultural heritage information. It's not that much of an investment. So uh, hopefully we'll get there. Um, so yes, OK. And so this is a bit, bel belaboring, a bit belaboring the point, but anyhow. Uh, so imagine this is the world that we wanted to describe. Uh, then um, there are different schemas uh, give us different ways of representing that uh, world. So we could have the English sentence, the cat is on the mat. Or uh, we could have uh, a table uh, that said, described things are on mats uh, and uh, had the cat. Uh, or we could have the Chinese sentence, sentence uh, Mao Zai, whatever, Shang. Um, or we could have some formal logical representation. There is some x and some y, such as x is cat, y is a mat, and x is on y. Um, or a nice little sketch. All of those things should be re-representable uh, by the ontology. And so uh, we have the nouns, uh, we have the verbs, uh, and we have uh, this triple uh, structure, which is subject, verb, object. So. Uh, your, uh, so in this simple ontology which I've made to represent the cat is on the mat world, uh, we only have two nouns and one relation, and the noun is object, and uh, one noun is object, and the other is place. Uh, then it has a description of what I mean by this noun, how I can use this noun legally, how I can use this relation legally, and uh, then this uh, mini sentence should be able to re-describe all of those. That's the sort of overall push. Um, and yes. So so um, this afternoon we're going to have these manuals uh, for uh, CDOC CRM and you're going to use them as a reference to do your modeling activity uh, and the goal isn't to uh, read this manual from front to back, uh, but uh, you need to know how to use it. Uh, and so for any ontology, at the start there will be a description uh, which is called the scope. And the scope says uh, what this is meant to cover. So the ontology will provide you nouns and verbs for talking about uh, a specific domain of d discourse, but uh, because we are limited and ungodlike, uh, it is uh, not the whole domain of discourse. So CDOC CRM is good for talking about cultural heritage information. It doesn't have pretensions to talk about uh, industrial processes, for example. And it lays that out, and that helps to decide a lot of philosophical issues that can come up when you're trying to use an ontology where you say, well, shouldn't we be able to talk about that, or shouldn't we be able to talk about that? Uh, the scope will tell you what you should be able to talk about and what you shouldn't be able to talk about. So it might mean uh, that you are trying to model something and then you realize, well, actually, what I'm talking about goes beyond or is other than uh, this scope, in which case you say, I need to move off and look for another ontology or expand the definition. Uh, so that, uh, that's that. And then you have the classes and properties. So classes, I've said, are nouns and properties are verbs. Uh, and uh, I think it's useful to spend a moment to talk about uh, actually reading the documents. Uh, uh, so. Each class has a number of things uh, that are used to describe it. So first of all, it has a label, and the label is a mnemonic device uh, to point you to what it's probably about. Uh, so it'll be physical object, or activity, or conceptual object, uh, all of which uh, should be, a, you think to yourself, OK, that's probably what I want. Uh, but it's an arbitrary label uh, where 
Afterwards, what the class really means is described in the scope note. And there'll be a long description that says, you should use it precisely for this. And you might be thinking, because it's called conceptual object, that you should use it for this. But you definitely shouldn't use it for that. Uh, so uh, you take the label as a clue to go and find out, is this class for me? But afterwards, uh, you have to go and read the scope note and say, is it really for me? Uh, other things that really help you to know if it's really for you is to look at the examples and see, did other people use it this way? In which case, that's fantastic. You're probably on the right, uh, on the right track. And finally, um, the class is associated, I, I said before uh, that the ontology is a mini language, but it's formally defined. So you can't put together the classes and relations any which way you want, uh, but uh, Relations are defined to only work with some classes and not other classes, and you have to string them together in the right way. So when you're looking at a class to re-describe your information, uh, you're not just looking at, you're not doing a classification game. It's not like, did I find the right term so I can say uh, we're talking about physical things? Great. Uh, because afterwards, you probably want to say something much more rich and interesting than that. Like, this thing is composed of a subpart that has a certain de de degradation phenomenon that happened from this time to that time. If you want to describe something like that, then you have to see that your class uh, has properties that are going to allow you to continue to make your sentence uh, and describe this world. So you'll have a list. So yeah, this is the actual representation. So at the top is the label. And then down here is a list of all the properties that this thing has. So if you're looking to see if a class is appropriate for your modeling situation, you also want to see, does it have a property that allows me to expand on and represent the information I want to represent? Um, so, and then the same thing uh, holds for properties. Also, they have labels and scope notes and so on, and you should read them and be careful. Uh, the only difference to uh, belabor between the class and uh, the relation is that uh, the relation defines a domain and a range. And that's pointing to the class from which I can be started and the class to which I can end. Uh, so it'll be like um, you can state that, well, well, I'll get to it in a second, but uh, in CDOC CRM, only uh, events uh, can have time. So you can't immediately say of the cup 1954. Uh, because that's nonsensical. So you can't make the sentence, cup has time 1954, because that doesn't mean it was made then, doesn't mean it was destroyed then, doesn't mean that uh, it was refashioned then. Uh, so in CDOC CRM, uh, the, uh, the property that talks about time uh, is restricted to events uh, and it goes to time. So when you're looking at a, at a property, you really need to know, can I apply this to the class I'm talking about? And if I can't, uh, can I make a ch chain of relations to um, make that expression? So, for example, if I had in my mind the pointless sentence, uh, cup and 1954, um, then, and I, I went and I found the time property, and it said, uh, this only goes from event to, um, to time. Uh, so how do I represent that? So then I have to find, you can make a chain of relations because you're making sentences. So I could say the cup was involved in the time, in the, in the event, and the event had the time 1954. Um, those are the kinds of chains of relations you'll, you'll start to figure out how to make. Um, and then uh, this is just to represent that, of course, uh, in the end, uh, CDOC CRM uh, makes these uh, triple patterns of information uh, and so rather than having this uh, traditional uh, sort of database uh, format we have something that looks akin to uh, many sentences uh, and which uh, undergirds this notion of ontologies as being or and semantic data as being uh, human readable and machine processable so even though this looks a little bit uh, abstract. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a, a, a CDOC CRM sentence which says there was an attribute assignment uh, which was an event of the curatorial project that assigned an attribute to a pot. Um, and so that should become, by the end of the two days, a relatively natural thing to be able to read. Uh, and 
it's somewhat more self-explanatory uh, than a set of tables uh, like that. Another thing uh, I think to point out, although this is not the best uh, slide uh, to do it on, uh, is this notion of uh, ISA, um, which, uh, oh, look, there's a little board, so. Still on camera? Um, So, um, CDOC CRM and all ontologies have this notion of uh, a basic relation which is called uh, ISA. Uh, And ISA means uh, that, um, so, I, I want a non CDOC CRM hierarchy quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's say thing, uh, table, and uh, what's a subtype of table? I don't know. IKEA table. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so, in ISA, we have the notion that we define things at a general level uh, and uh, then we can give them properties. So, we can say, all things that are things uh, can have a dimension. And then we have some sort of class called dimension. Also, I can't write, so it's point this is on the camera. Uh, so after that, because we have this notion of the property ISA, and I've declared that things can have dimensions, it means that IKEA table is a table, is a thing. So IKEA tables have the potential to have dimensions. Uh, And that's incredibly powerful for keeping uh, the size of the ontology small uh, because you can define really general properties at the top level of the ontology. So you have these high level abstract classes like thing that have dimensions that you would never use. And in the ontology, you probably end up using the bottom level classes all the time because we don't talk about abstract things. We talk about IKEA tables or this manuscript. but. The high-level ontology has said, okay, because your manuscript is a thing, it has dimensions and you could put it in a box and so on and so forth. Um, so that's, uh, that's important to keep in mind, uh, both for if you're looking at a lower-level class to understand where it lives in the ontology and what properties it inherits, uh, and uh, to understand that um, by doing this structure, um, you have uh, a number of advantages. So, in terms of uh, in terms of facilitating search, um, you uh, because we have this top level class, you can search at a very high level and say, I need to the, know the dimensions of things. And uh, e- because IKEA table is a thing, it means that I can have thousands of subclasses here. Uh, and it will return to me all the subclasses without me having to specify very complicated queries to do that. Um, And the other thing is that um, you can represent different levels of uncertainty or uh, lack of information. So if you don't know specifically that you're working with an IKEA table, uh, then you can always go up and model things at something at a more general level. So you can say, well, I'm not sure what it is, might be an IKEA table, but it definitely is a table. Uh, So you can move up to those levels of uncertainty and therefore not be forced to be more accurate about your information than you actually uh, want to be. So that's my segue on ESA. And now to the model itself. Oops. Uh, okay, plenty of time. So, CDOC CRM um, has these 90 cl- classes and 150 relations, um, but it's an event based model, uh, and if you uh, understand the strategy of event based modeling, uh, basically uh, that story repeats itself over and over again. So, the idea of the event based model uh, is that uh, we, uh, when we're talking about objects and we're talking about the past, 
we actually want to, um, the information that we want to record and retrieve uh, is about what information this object gives us about the past. Uh, and uh, so rather than uh, traditional documentation systems which have us pointed at the object and say, well, it has this dimension and so on and so forth, uh, we want to be able to retrieve the sequence of events uh, in which uh, an object participated from which we can draw conclusions about um, either about the past or about its present state. Um, so uh, in event-based modeling, you're always, always going through an event node to talk about uh, the object uh, and the properties that it has. Uh, so the first rule of CDOC CRM uh, is uh, that if you have a time span, it only goes through uh, a temporal entity. Um, and then, uh, what else do we want to say about that? And when we're talking about um, uh, the basic, uh, so, uh, give me a second. Uh, so, if we're interested in documenting an object and say a, a measurement, rather than just saying direct or a dimension, rather than saying uh, this object uh, has dimension so many meters, uh, so many units, and so on and so forth, uh, rather we say this object was in event, an event of measurement which produced a dimension. And that way uh, we can, we start to develop a richer structure which you can imagine is very useful in something like conservation science, where it's not interesting to know uh, in general that this thing had a measurement, but we measured it at this time or after this event or before this event uh, in order to have uh, a more analytical story of uh, the, uh, the sequence of events of this object. So we talk about uh, physical objects or conceptual objects being involved in time, uh, in events which have time and take place somewhere. Um, and then the other major category is actors. Uh, and actors are the only thing in CDOC CRM that have causality. So they're people that can uh, initiate an event, uh, that can make a choice, that can decide to do a conservation action or not do a conservation action. Uh, and then of anything in the model, uh, we can say that it has a name uh, or it's uh, classified by a type. Uh, and also for the rest of the presentation, I've color-coded the things, uh, so because there's many classes and relations, so temporal entities are in blue, actors are in pink, uh, objects are in brown, conceptual things are in yellow, and so on. Um, so in learning CDOC CRM, um, rather than going through or, and also in doing the modeling or mapping activity, you're going to go and you're going to look at, uh, you're going to look at uh, a, a document you want to represent in CDOC CRM, and you have to choose a class that you want to start uh, modeling it with. So when you're first learning CDOC CRM, a good way of uh, thinking about it is to split it into the top level classes of the model. In the top of CDOC CRM, we have this distinction between temporal entities, persistent items, and places. So a uh, temporal entity uh, is what's in philosophy called a perdurant, uh, but it's like if you were to, it, it's an ongoing event. And so if you think about it in terms of if I stop time, would a part of this thing uh, be, would, would this thing still be fully present or would it just have uh, an indistinguishable, indistinguishable part? So for example, a wedding, is a temporal entity. So it's an event, something that's ongoing. So if you stop time and you had a slice of the wedding, you would just have people coming in or people going out or the kiss or so on and so forth. So that's a temporal entity. As opposed to a persistent item, uh, which would be, uh, which is stuff that has the same identity over time. So if we stop time uh, during the wedding and uh, there was, and we looked at the ring, and then we stopped time again, and we looked at the ring again, it would be wholly there in all of its properties. It's one thing. Uh, the same thing with the people in the wedding, the same thing with the flowers. 
then we can start to have arguments but in conservation about well the flowers are degrading and so on and so forth so there are some fuzzy points but the basic idea is uh, ongoing events here and things that are uh, solid and have the same identity through time here uh, and then place in CDOC serum is used for indicating an exact geometric spot at which something happens so you could say uh, the for example yeah this room would be a place at which something could happen greater London would be a place at something uh, at which something could happen uh, but also, um, uh, because we'd be talking about conservation, so some, some subsection of the surface of my phone could be a place at which something could happen, a, a degradation or a conservation action, uh, or that sort of thing. So, um, uh, I also have another slide called the, the CRM Limbo, uh, but basically, uh, when you first start picking classes, uh, I tend to think you should start with this top-level overview and you say, which way should I go? Should I, am I trying to talk about an event? Okay, let's go down into the, into the is a hierarchy again and try to seek down as far as I can go until I find just the right class for me to express what I'm interested in. Uh, or it's not an event at all, it's a persistent item, but what kind? And then you start drilling down into that is a hierarchy. So start with that overview of events versus solid things uh, versus uh, places. Uh, and then you would drill down. Um, so, ooh, that went really fast. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, <coughs> because it's quite abstract and uh, somewhat uh, dry, uh, here's the Battle of the Stick People. Uh, but the Battle of the Stick People just attempts to uh, illustrate that uh, here again we have this event, uh, and if you stop this event at any moment, there's nothing that puts it together as being the battle of the sick people because nothing was the same between frame to frame. But overall, we can all recognize that there is this battle of the sick people, it's very epic, and it has some start and some end. And we can also recognize that there are these two people in there which are persistent items, the swords, the triangle, the sun, and they might you know, expand or contract or what have you, and yet nevertheless, they're recognizably the same entities playing through this event. And then, although we can't particularly see it, there must be some extent to the battlefield of the sick people, uh, so, for a very simple uh, way of uh, conceptualizing it, uh, that would be the top level of CDOT CRM. Uh, now, what I want to do is look at little bits of the model in chunks uh, and explain what's going on. Uh, and um, so, uh, this is representing the top classes of uh, the temporal. Um, uh, branch of CDOC CRM uh, and it's representing both the classes and there is a hierarchy uh, so this this line represents the is a hierarchy so for example is saying that the end of existence is an event which is a period which is a temporal entity um, and it's also uh, showing their uh, their the, the properties that they offer for you to um, uh, document information so uh, at the highest level, we just have temporal entity, which is a super abstract class, which you would never use, which is just something took some time. So that's why it has the property has time span, uh, and, that, uh, and that's what it does. Afterwards, we go down to uh, period. And for period, you can think of things like uh, the Jurassic period, or Sturm und Drang, uh, or uh, I don't know, the Great Depression, um, so large time spans uh, and the knowledge that we have about them is that they took place at um, some overall geographic area or, and this could be quite interesting for uh, conservation science, took place on some specific thing, so in some sort of physical body. Um, and uh, also we can start doing uh, part whole relationships. So this idea of consists of is to say, you know, the, well, for Greeks, uh, so I don't know, the bro anyhow, the Bronze Age consists of uh, the early Bronze Age and the Middle Bronze Age and late Bronze Age and so on and so forth. Um, then uh, we get down to the notion of event. Uh, and in the notion of event, we can start talking about, we have more information 
Uh, and we can talk about the fact that there was uh, some actors there uh, who were potentially doing something, but we don't know what or what the particular role was. And we can say that uh, it occurred in the presence of some persistent items, so we can talk about physical objects uh, that were involved in the events or ideas and so on and so forth. Uh, and so that, uh, if, you start, if you're thinking about conservation science, I mean, you start thinking about processes of, uh, uh, for example, if an object was sitting in a case uh, and there was a certain level of humidity or it was sitting beside some other thing that had a certain kind of material in it which could be detrimental to its conservation, so there you'd be able to talk about the event of it being in this case for that amount of time in the presence of that object. Therefore, maybe there's something to investigate. Um, and then uh, we have the notion of activity. Uh, when we get down to activity, we're talking about an event that takes place uh, that was uh, intentionally carried out to, to do something. So in the notion of, uh, or again, making vague references to conservation science, I mean, this could be uh, studying an object to do an analysis uh, to come up with a conservation plan, or it could be actually doing an intervention, uh, choosing to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, so then we talk about actors carrying out an activity, um, and then, Last but not least, we have these two classes, beginning of, beginning of existence and end of existence. Uh, so they're high level classes to say, um, I guess, yeah, uh, I want to go back one second to this thing. Uh, I didn't talk very uh, uh, at the high level about physical objects and conceptual objects, but they're, they're important. Uh, so. We have the notion of a physical object, which is just some thing that's substantial, it's one-off, it's you know, your manuscript or the, the, my, my shirt or uh, that board, uh, and it can only be in one place at one time, and it came to be through some sort of event, uh, and it'll be so long as we don't sufficiently degrade its particular properties, and then it goes out of existence uh, through some sort of destruction event. Conceptual objects are ideas, uh, so they're coming up with Hamlet uh, or uh, the plan to treat this object in such and such a way, and they're also something that's real and has a persistence over time, uh, but they don't, they're not singular like a physical object. As soon as I think of them, I can write them down or I can record them into a voice recorder or what have you, so they can have multiple presences or multiple carriers uh, in the world. Um, so this, um, these beginning of existence and end of existence classes are top level uh, classes to say of any persistent item, um, this thing came to be at such and such a time, so it had the time span of 1964, beginning of existence, this uh, person, or this uh, book, uh, and end of existence. Uh, but then we have many subclasses, which we'll explore in the afternoon, which talk about the beginning of existence of an actor, the beginning of existence of a physical thing, the end of existence of a physical thing, which have more spe specific uh, classes. But for temporal discussions, learning those classes is basically the overall CRM logic for talking about coming to be, ending existence, uh, and intentional or not intentional acts. Um, so, place um, is actually a pretty simple class. Um, it has uh, just a bunch of relations that allow you to make uh, uh, discussions about uh, part whole, which is the consists of, or falls within and then talking about bordering with, so this place was on bordering with that place or having an overlap. And so it'll be interesting in our modeling discussions whether, you know, if you're trying to talk about uh, on a particular object, if there's a, uh, a, a degradation phenomenon happening in a particular place, if this is a sufficient set of uh, properties to allow you to describe the kinds of uh, interrelations uh, that you need to talk about. Um, and this graph uh, is 
an illustration of the sort of larger models that you start to be able to build um, when you put all the classes together. So although place is a, a simple class that just has these four properties, it's used by the temporal classes uh, to do a bunch of different things. So I already mentioned uh, with period uh, that we can talk about where something took place. So that's one thing. But we also have a very specialized class of move, uh, which allows you to talk about, well, it was taken from place X and moved to place Y. Uh, we can talk, we can document the physical thing and say it's at that physical location or it has a particular subpart that I want to talk about. Um, and yes, and then obviously I think, yeah, that's just trying to say, well, a production event, which is the creation of a physical object, uh, is a period, so we can talk about where something was produced or where was something was modified, so we can talk about the lab where something was changed, you know, something was worked on. Um, so that's basically, we've already covered temporal entities, the top level, that was the one slide. Uh, place is the other uh, top level. Uh, and then we get into persistent items. Uh, and uh, persistent item uh, goes into this breakdown, uh, which I already uh, went back for. So we have this notion of physical thing as opposed to a conceptual object and an actor. The actor being, so actors are people or institutions or groups. There is something with volition that can actually uh, make a choice to do something in the world. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll skip that. I'll skip those examples. Um, so, uh, if you look at the top level of CDOT CRM, sometimes you run into funny, lo funny looking is relations, and it can be confusing as to why they're like that. So. Uh, I thought I'd pick out uh, what's going on here. So uh, in the end, you're probably going to be using these lower level classes like physical man-made thing. That's an object that was made through some production event from some actual people. Uh, or you'll be talking about a symbolic object, which is like the text on a page or what have you. Uh, but at the top of the uh, hierarchy, you have these confusing things. So. First of all, we have the distinction between a thing and an actor. So an actor is something that has volition, so we separate it off from things. Uh, then we have the notion of human-made thing, um, so uh, which separates out. We have a general notion of physical thing, which could be a mountain, or, or me, or a book, or the, the iPhone, uh, but uh, then we have things that have been interacted by or have been produced through man-made intervention. So we want to be able to say that some physical things are made by human beings, uh, but all conceptual objects are made by human beings uh, because there is no conceptual object that was rained down by uh, a higher being or what have you. Uh, then we have other uh, distinctions like the legal object so legal objects are something to which you can claim rights or on which uh, rights can be asserted. So all physical things uh, is a legal object because you can make a claim over them. Uh, but not all conceptual objects uh, are a legal object because until you've encoded it somehow, you've uh, put it down as a track or written it on a piece of paper, uh, it can't be owned. So you can't own ideas, therefore you get these weird matrices. Uh, but they represent the correct conceptual structure. Um, so this is to show that uh, story uh, with the properties to see the kinds of expressions you can make. Uh, so uh, with the persistent item, we can talk about the fact that it was involved in an event. That's the was present at. Then we get to the level of thing. Uh, we start having this notion of dimension. So uh, whether it be a conceptual object uh, or a physical object, we can talk about its dimension because we can talk about how many paragraphs, how many words, and so on and so forth of a conceptual object. Um, and we can also talk about this property is very useful, shows features of. So an object can have a similarity to. Uh, so we can say this thing looks like that thing in such and such a way. 
Um, then uh, from the legal object class, we get the ability to talk about which rights uh, are, are claimed on that object and by who. Uh, and when we get down to uh, physical thing, uh, we get the property for talking about its parthood, so which is composed of. So we can say this object, you know, the table was made of the top and the leg one, the leg two, the leg three, the leg four, and we can talk about the the materials that are used in composing it. So it's made of oak or metal, so on and so forth. George. Yes. <clears throat> Max, another fifteen minutes. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. I'm. Uh, I, I have four minutes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's as far as I'm planning to go. Um, so let's see what would be most useful. I think this is most useful to, to leave off on in terms of uh, the kinds of things that you're, you're going to model. So uh, if we're talking about a, a physical thing, uh, then as I said, we have this top level class for physical things which are just generated by anything nature. Uh, so for that, we have the notion of somebody could own it, so it has former or current keeper. We can talk about the fact that it has uh, uh, parts, so that's the it consists of, and we can talk about the material it's made of. Um, and then we get this matrix down here, which is interesting. So we have this distinction between physical object and physical feature. So the notion of the physical object uh, is it's the the entire thing that has one whole uh, nature to it, it has distinct boundaries uh, and I can pick it up and move it in this shelf or that shelf or what have you, it's an independent object. The physical feature is something uh, still physical but it inheres in and is somehow ad hocly related to the overall object. So this, this part of this chair is a physical feature or if I were to, yeah, uh, graffiti or otherwise to face the university property, that scratch that I would make in the uh, thing would be a physical feature. And that's an important philosophical, I mean, it's an important representational difference because uh, you would maybe want to count how many physical objects you have and where they are and how you, the physical feature is just something that's inhering in uh, the object that you're working with. So that's an important distinction. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then we have this notion of physical, human-made things, so that's just to make the distinction that uh, this object is made by anthropogenic origin, uh, and so you end up with uh, the subclass of physically made, the man, uh, human-made things, which are man-made objects, or human-made objects, so that's this chair, and human-made features, which would be me cutting something into the chair. Um, and what else? And then I guess, yes, to finally we have this notion of shows visual item or depicts. Uh, and so you're constantly uh, looking at MC.CRM CRM of relating the different levels of the ontology. So uh, for example, um, the idea of showing a visual item is that uh, you have a physical object and it carries an image or a text uh, and that's this unique manuscript for example uh, and so you want to you have your discourse about the fact that I have this manuscript that was made at this time by these people with this material uh, but at the same time uh, it's showing a visual item a conceptual object uh, which is uh, repeated across ten other manuscripts and I want to make the connection that uh, there's this particular iconographic representation uh, which is shown on this page which is not unique to this item. So this notion of shows visual item is a way to connect from a physical singular thing to a conceptual thing which can be repeated again across uh, different objects. Um, and so I have one minute <laughs> uh, and so no, no, it's okay. I mean, basically, this is the last. This is the last slide of the model. Um, so then, in the so we had temporal entities and those seven classes you could learn. Then we had place, and it's just one class, so it's a happy thing to learn. 
uh, and then you have persistent items which you should break down in your head between actors, which are humans and institutions that can do something in the world and change things, pers uh, uh, physical things, which are singular, solid, and conceptual objects, which are things like poems and stories or images, uh, which you can refer to by one name, but they can be uh, present on many different objects. And so uh, I kind of skipped over the differentiation between conceptual objects, but we saw the high level distinctions between physical objects in the classes. And this is uh, a pointer to uh, the distinctions between uh, different actor classes. So we have the general notion of an actor. So say if you have in a database, uh, that's an example of having some lack of knowledge. If you have a database and you've uh, put together both people and institutions, and you don't have some sort of filter to say this is a this is a person, this is an institution. Then the ontology allows you to represent your ignorance of that situation. So you can say, well, I have somebody, and I know that they're I have a thing, and I know that they're an actor. I know they did something in the world. They have an address. Uh, they they did a conservation action. But I'm not sure if they're a person or a group. So you can use actor. Um, otherwise, you have the notion of person, which is a a, a natural person. Uh, a group, which is uh, some two or more people who can act together uh, to, with a common will, and a legal body, which would be something with uh, a legal status as well. And the actor class gives you the ability to talk about uh, who has a right, where to contact them, uh, and where you can find them in the present or the past. Um, and so that is basically... CDOC CRM top <laughs> classes in 45 minutes. Uh, and uh, I think it'll be, it, it's a bit dry to see all of the uh, slides. And uh, normally, uh, if I do it in a different way, then I, I stop and actually ask you to work on things. But uh, it'll take on more life and interest, uh, hopefully, in the afternoon as we work on these things together. So thank you for your time. Yeah, buildings are tricky. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there's a classic argument about whether or not you could, in principle, move a building, in which case it could be a physical object. Um, but uh, actually, the extension uh, uh, CRMBA, Building Archaeology, yeah. they're trying to look at that. I mean, and the question is, yeah. you have to deal with, I mean, because one of the features of a yeah, building. There is the Yeah, I mean, no, it's very focused on the uh, on the composition yeah, on the composition of the building. But I mean, the interesting thing is that you know an essential feature of the building is the empty space. Um, so modeling that is also uh, important to be able to capture. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a physical feature, a physical object. If you're just using zero and base, but okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? George, I, I was wondering if you can say very quickly a couple of things uh, about the extensions, how how they work in relation to the main CRM. Sure. And maybe a couple of things about um, searching using classes, so going more specific or more generic search according to the level of the class you are. Hmm. Um, sure. So, I mean... Um the notion of the uh, extensions of CDOC CRM uh, is that um, you saw these classes that have things like uh, beginning of existence, end of existence, activity, uh, and uh, so those give a high level logic to uh, when something is intended, when something is not intended. Uh, but then uh, if you're working in a specific domain, you want to have classes that sound like something that you do. Uh, and uh, that describes something you do. So um, there'll be some, there'll be uh, a class like um, 
in CRM science, uh, <coughs> observation, uh, which is an intentional action, uh, which is trying to, uh, uh, which relates to a, a physical thing and attempts to uh, uh, define or see a particular property. So uh, you can basically take the extension, if you find an extension that seems close to uh, the kinds of things that you're trying to model, uh, you can take that extension uh, and work with it uh, primarily and then see where you have to have recourse uh, to, uh, to base. Because uh, all of the classes that are defined in the uh, extension uh, are harmonized up to uh, CDOC CRM base. So if we have a class like observation, uh, then I would know because I know CDOC CRM that an observation is an intentional action, so it's a subclass of E7 activity. But by taking the extension, which is more appropriate to your work, you can sort of avoid dealing with uh, the whole mass of uh, CRM based classes and look at these more particular classes that are, are, are of interest to your work. Um, and uh, what was the other part of the question? Uh, and maybe a couple of things about yeah. you know, when you searching and things yeah. that we described at different levels, you can use the... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, again... Um, yeah, maybe I can use the example about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, well, it's basically, uh, again, it's either story. Um, so... Uh, now I can use CRM classes, I guess, so E2 and then E4 and then uh, whatever, E7 and uh, what else? Uh, oh yeah, please don't use just numbers. So activity, period, temporal entity, uh, and uh, this is acquisition. So, um, again, uh, has time span? Uh, and time span. So, one thing is that um, because of this is a hierarchy, um, if I, I can use the class itself and I could create a query that says, bring me back all of the events. And even, and so here I've got a relatively light tree structure to get down to acquisition. Uh, but by, I can search temporal entity, and because all these things are defined as temporal entity, uh, I will get back all instances of activity and acquisition and period. So I'll have, you know, the Jurassic period, and I'll have, uh, you know, the lady dies wedding, and I'll have the purchase of X art object. All of those things will be returned to me. Um, so that's one interesting feature of having uh, these, uh, this is a relationship, re relationship thing. The other thing that's really interesting uh, is that you have this notion of, um, oh, I didn't have it in there. Um, you have the notion of is that in properties as well. Sorry, that's just a scribble now. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so we have this notion uh, I showed of events and that you has, uh, has participated in or something like that. And so you can have this general notion of, I don't know, there was an event and Thanasis was there. Was he the speaker? Was he watching? Was he just in the general circumstances? So I can represent that level of knowledge uh, had participant. But then I can assert stronger knowledge, like uh, carried out by, that's an activity. So that's saying, George was there, and he was the speaker, great. Uh, then I can have, their, they, you get very specific properties. So it was like, uh, in the acquisition, the title of object X was transferred to Bob. Now, the transferred to Bob property is a sub-property of carried out by, is a sub-property of participated in. So not only can I do a search and say, bring me back all of the things that are temporal events or all things that are physical objects or something like that, but I can also search and say, 
I want to know, I'm going to start at a very vague level and say, I want to know all the people that were related to this event. Uh, and then it'll bring back, and so I don't need to know these 5,000 sub-properties and all their specificity. I just know the top level one, and it returns all of that granular information. But then I can see it and I can say, oh, okay, well, it's interesting that you can track actually just people getting the title, uh, and then you can refine your search and get just exactly the kind of information that you want. So, and that relates back to finish off and give you the floor. Uh, that relates back to how the extensions would work. So, if you're thinking about uh, I mean, the ultimate, you know, dream uh, is that um, uh, we have a conservation extension, uh, and then uh, you're, you, you've created a number of classes that are sufficient to and uh, and, and, and understandable to you, the classes and relations you need to describe, specific processes that you're talking about. <coughs> but they're harmonized up to these top level classes, so you'll, in the end, not only be able to share information amongst conservation scientists, uh, but furthermore, uh, the curator will be able to search for events that happened on this, uh, on this object at this vague level of generality and get back some really highly detailed information about this thing happened, therefore I can follow the link to the person who carried it out and talk to them to make sure that what I do next is not going to be a bad idea. Um, and likewise, uh, somebody who's working on an object could use that same sort of feature to say, if they, they'll, they'll say, okay, I need to find uh, the people and the places of, that were related to this thing through an event in the last while, and you might find out that some sort of move happened that you didn't know anything about, and maybe that added some sort of environmental condition that is incredibly pertinent to know before you do the next action. So that's the kind of complex level of information that you should be able to get by having a very specific model for acquisitions or different conservation actions, but you can search on these high-level properties and return uh, the specific work of different researchers in different domains. Uh, yeah, the other important thing that is that not all of us have to use the same program to describe things. You have to get, do our descriptions at different levels and it will still work. We will still search across. Mm. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, George.